explain. My name is George Dillman, and I'm, I have over 30 years in the martial arts. And I've studied a lot of different martial arts with a lot of different people. I have studied under five people who were 10th degree black belt out of Okinawa. And I have studied under almost every American master that you know of. Everybody has different ideas, and everybody has their own viewpoint. I don't feel that anybody's is wrong, and I don't feel that any style is better than any other style. Everybody has an idea, and it's what you make of it. It's like we give you the football, it's whether you can get a touchdown with it or not that counts. So what we're going to tell you are some ideas that I got out of Kata, and the research that I've done, everything that I have I can back up with nerve specialists, muscle specialists, acupuncturists, acupressurists, and I tell people, if you don't believe me, ask a doctor that knows about muscle whether a punch should be three-quarter or should be full twist. Ask a martial artist that knows about pressure points, because with a full twist punch, there are no pressure points in the body that can be hit. They can be hit, but no effect takes place on your opponent. We have a whole series of tapes available on not only pressure points, but the grappling techniques hidden within forms. The only thing I caution people is, that if you're studying this at home, that you seek the advice of a professional martial arts instructor to help you with the study. And you don't just go hitting people on pressure points to find out what the end result is. The pressure points that I show you are single application. We do work multiple application. We work the kata, and my feeling is the kata were developed by people who were samurai and were killers. Same as in the Old West here. When Doc Holliday drew the gun, he drew the gun to kill you. He didn't draw the gun to block or to wound. The moves in the katas were created as an ultimate result to kill. However, in my school, I call blocks blocks, and I say, this is a mild application. I mentioned earlier in a take that I had a little kid that heard this, went home told his mom that katas were created to kill. Mother called me up, got all excited. I said, no, it's balance and coordination. He'd have to be a very high level black belt to understand the killing application and or all the pressure points of the body. As I talk about the pressure points, I also get involved in talking about age. A person as he gets older can't apply the same speed and strength that he did when he was 17, 18, 19, 20 up to 30, and pressure points become a more important part of the martial arts the older you get in age. The six pressure points that I work with primarily that are most important, and when I say the most important, I can't emphasize that enough, because the six are on the arm, and they're two, one half inch above the wrist on the bone side. The wrist one half inch up. Where this muscle ends is a pressure point and directly across from it, another one. And then there's one that lies right in between those two muscles. That kind of controls the energy into the arm at all. You strike it and the whole arm numbs. A pressure point on this side controls the bending of the elbow and we have several pressure points that lie in here. For pressure point, Study, I recommend any acupuncture book or acupressure book because they'll show you where they're at. The katas or forms that are used in the martial arts contain and hide the angle and the direction needed to get and make that pressure point work. If you have a move that's to a 45 and you're on a point, it will not drop your opponent unless you do the move 45. This is my theory on the subject, and there are a lot of people that have their own theory on this, and they show what they have found and broke down in the katas. I have a series of moves that I do. You do not have to do kata. I work with many different styles and people that practice self-defense that do no kata at all, or they do completely different katas than I do they can still find my application useful to their art because I don't care what style you are, this move 
is the same whether it's in one of the Japanese or Okinawan peon or heon forms as they call them, or whether it's in one of the Korean forms. The Korean forms do this particular move. The moves go back to China and the original people that developed them. 750 years ago, the, origi the first original Tai Chi form that I, I read contained the angle and the direction. It had something like 750 moves, a very long, slow, lengthy kata, but it contained all the angle and the direction for all the pressure points of the body. From that kata, all other self-defense evolved. The self-defense come out of it, and then you have different people that created different forms for techniques that they favor. For instance, a lot of styles have a short form called Naihanchi. It's just a short, quick form. Naihanchi refers to a man's name. I was told prior to my studies that it meant fighting with my back to the wall. I was told that stepping is stepping over rice paddies. A lot of that didn't make sense. Then I find out that the man's name that developed it was Chinese, and his name was Han, H-A-N, Chi. And the word Nahanji refers to the points, meaning pressure points, of a man named Han Chi. The points of Han Chi, and when you know that and can apply those pressure points, in that kata, the kata becomes a very deadly, serious form. Another kata we do, which is tension, san chin, I found out means san chin. Some people said it means three wars, three islands, three. Why would they name a, for, a, a form after three wars? The kata, that particular form, is named after three pressure points. San chin refers to three pressure point attacking. And all the way through that form, you're only <coughs> on three pressure points. It's only possible to get a three with the moves that are in the kata. When you attack one pressure point on your opponent, it causes pain. When you attack two pressure points simultaneously, the pain actually meets in the middle. So if I hit a pressure point here, he gets pain here. If I hit a pressure point here, he gets pain there. If I hit both simultaneously, the pain crashes on that nerve. Now it's only possible to enter pain onto the nerve or into the nerve through a pressure point. It's done with what we call energy transfer. I transfer energy in my arm or body into your pressure point, and as I do that, it enters in and sends pain, and that's why the electrical pain shoots out that nerve. If I enter in two pressure points in the same meridian or the same nervous system, at the same time, the pain meets in the middle and causes a crash. So therefore, if I use a pressure point on the hand of the arm and did one on the shoulder, my opponent would swear that his elbow hurt. If I do a pressure point on the arm and on the opposite leg, my man can double over with stomach cramps or pains because the pain will meet there. I would like to caution everyone that you're to have proper instruction. Talk to an acupuncturist. You are not to demonstrate or do these moves on anyone because some of them can be very dangerous and serious. For instance, you should not practice or ever do pressure points that crisscross the body. They're very serious. If I do a pressure point on this arm and on this leg, the pain doubling over meets in the middle and can do internal organ damage to my person. But that's why so many katas have crisscross and cross strikes because you are striking this side of the body and this side of the body and the pain meets at the heart, the liver, the kidney, the stomach, the spleen and does serious damage to my opponent. All of 
this is contained in the kata. You do not have to know angle and direction if you practice the kata and have a serious breakdown for your move. You do not have to know the, the laws of nature, even though I study them. Laws of nature mean that this point is a fire point. This point is a metal point. Fire will melt metal. If you hit the pressure point that lies in this muscle range, you will numb the entire arm of your opponent. If you touch this one first, it will numb his arm and kick his legs out from under him that he falls down if they're done at the same time. Fire melts the metal, and that's what I'm talking about, the laws of nature. But you don't have to understand that full realm because it's all contained in the kata. Another law of nature, the metal cuts wood. So this is a metal point. On the legs are liver points, which are wood. I have to strike the metal before I attack the wood. Metal cuts wood, it will do serious damage to my opponent. Done in reverse, nothing happens. Touch the wood and hit the metal, nothing. That's why people have not been able to discover this or find it out. They just poked and punched at different parts of the body. If it's in a proper order, it does serious damage to your opponent because the metal will totally destroy the wood or the liver. And that's why the arm pressure points <clears throat> are about the most important part of your study. The arms are the closest things to you. Plus, if you're a little person and a big person grabs you with a long arm, attacking the arm pressure point brings him into you to be able to get to the body. But attacking the arm pressure points actually set up the body pressure points to attack. As I explained, metal is on the arm. There is wood pressure points in the body. If I attack metal, it helps set up the wood for total destruction of the wood when I go in with my next move, and that's why there are moves like this in kata. We do a kata, and we do do this, and people say, you're blocking, and you're blocking. In my theory behind kata, there are no blocks at all in the kata. None. Blocking, you practice in your freestyle fighting. <clears throat> Most people can just block naturally. You just block. Kata, and this is what makes karate an art. It's not an art with block, 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 block. It's an art with learning where and how to put those fingers in those hands. One of the, the top martial artists in the world has a book. And in his book he said, on the fist and the hand there are ten weapons. And none of them, none of them, the most basic, he doesn't say none of them, the most basic is a fist. That's the most basic of the weapons. They. The fist will not hurt your opponent as much as one knuckle, one knuckle, the open hand, the shuto, the chop, the fingers for a thrust, the ridge hand. On our discovery channel on, on cable vision, there's a pilot show on about acupuncture and acupressure, and they just showed that the energy is the strongest. I've explained how the energy comes down, crosses over, and goes back. And they showed with infrared lighting how the energy goes down and actually coming this direction comes out of the hand here. More energy for transfer comes out this side. That's why you can hurt somebody more with a ridge hand than you can with a chop hand. Unless the chop hand knows where it's going and you're properly trained to get energy transfer with the chop hand. Energy transfer means a little bit of movement in you to be able to strike and control your energy. For instance, as I snap my wrist for a motion, I actually stop the energy at the wrist to attack my opponent. 
hurts me more than if I did this and then hit my opponent, I hit him with it bending as I strike. That means my energy stops, transfers into my opponent's pressure point and causes damage. The fist alone should go with a snapping cock and it should snap down and just cock as it hits. That alone is energy transfer. I transfer with this. I've explained in earlier tapes why we do not use a full twist punch. I'm gonna get Mr. Larry Tinnen over and I'm gonna show energy transfer minor. These techniques I do with my people, we hold back some of the power. When you do them, I ask you to use restraint and do the same thing. They heard me drop, and I only do what I have to to make their knees buckle to show you as an educational process. When I go out and do seminars, and I do seminars and lectures all over the United States, I've been invited to go to Alaska, New Zealand, Australia. My seminars are in acupuncture, and when I do them, I even teach the pressure points of the body, the head, instant knockout points. Knockout points are pressure points that are in clusters that can be touched or touched in, conjun in conjunction with fire, melts metal, metal cuts wood, and your opponent passes out. But one of the couple things I want to show you in the basics are the cock of the punch and the karate chop. I hope to share and improve your style. Your style can stay the same. I don't want anybody to be my style. Your style is the same. I hope with my 30 years, some of the knowledge I have, I'm putting on videotapes because I just don't want to pass away and not be able to leave the many years of study I have to other people. Larry, come on up. <clears throat> just simple, I just want to show you the punch, if I hit, most people hit with a flat fist, which is no good. You should hit with the two knuckles. But the two knuckles here have to do this as you hit. That's energy transfer. Energy comes down, comes up. If I had a glass of water and I wanted to splash some out, I would do that. Same thing's true with my knuckles. I want the energy to go out there. One theory, and I don't want to say that's wrong, but one theory, there are places you can hit with the small finger because the energy is the strongest right here. A very famous martial artist thought because the energy comes down and comes over, it comes out here, and you can hit with this the strongest, he tried to hit somebody in the body and fractured this bone. Two places. The energy's too strong, this bone's too weak, and if you look at a skeleton, it's almost not connected. It just lies there along the side. So to hit with this would be improper unless it's to a soft place. There are places that we use this knuckle for energy transfer, but not just to punch the body. So when you see somebody punch with this, and they're hitting with this, it's got to be to a soft place, which could be the arm, the soft in here. A lot of places to hit with that. But to get the energy which is coming this way, out of those two knuckles, take that, which splash it out, and I just rest it. I'm just gonna rest it on him and just do nothing more than that. And you'll see energy just move him a little bit. It's not gonna knock him anywhere. It's just to prove a point that you can do this at home with somebody and improve your punch in the martial arts. We just said it here. Feel the difference? It buckles them. It's a lot different than this. You can sit and you can hear that. But that's just a punch. If you connect with the two knuckles striking on a pressure point, it spills the energy. I explained on a previous tape on how to strike in the solar plex region. And you must do this. You must have the cock of the hand to get the energy down for that strike. The energy here, just this, just this motion, puts down. And if it's done as it strikes, it then can transfer the energy into the pressure point and record it on the heart delivered wherever you're at. 
One of the things I like to explain in the kata is the move of the punch and the chop. Because I see, when I go out in seminars, the biggest mistake, and I say it's a mistake, and I stand right here and say it's wrong, and I don't say anything else is wrong. Everything you do is right. Everybody's style is right. There's no style that's better than another. Hope they can, they can help each other. But one of the things that I, I find improper is that thumb curl for a chop. You try my theory, and it's not really my theory, because I have this recorded on tapes from high-ranking 10th degree black belts. I have it in a book by one of the highest masters of the world where he says the thumb is to be straight on the inside. There's a movie in our day and age called The Karate Kid, and in that movie he describes to him, he says, keep the thumb straight and on the inside. The little finger should be just to the inside. It shouldn't lie there like that. The thumb shouldn't be up there like that. Feel it. It feels weak here. That's wrong. You could not use that for a knife hand. They do this for a knife hand. The fingers would crumble. Ask a muscle specialist. When you pull the thumb and the little finger in to the inside, keep the thumb straight. You pull the muscle right here and make it taut or tight that it actually gives you a knife hand that could be used as a lethal weapon. It pulls this section tight through here and it truly allows you to use all of this as a weapon. Where this, the thumb will break. This, the little finger can break. And if the little finger gets caught back here, it can injure you and even injure your heart. Because there's heart pressure points in the tip of the little finger and all along this region. So the little finger here could injure your own heart striking with it. The little finger got to be in to be protected. That's one of the weakest places in the body is the little finger. You can take anyone and put his little finger here, behind the ring finger, anyone, just put his little finger here and push and he, he will go down. In grappling, when he grabs me, you can always grab the little finger and once you got the little finger, look what happens. And not because of the strength over the little finger. You have a positive and negative energy in here that almost meet. The reason this is weak, it's one of the closest places in the human body that you have electricity together that could meet. That's why this is one of the weakest places in the entire body. If you get it to meet, your person would die. But you pull this up and move it to here so that that doesn't happen to you striking somebody. You keep it on the inside. The thumb is straight. When the thumb is bent, most of our people, they do this. And I asked one at a, at a tournament. I, I tried to help him. No, no, he said, that's my style. That's my style. Well, give me a reason, a reason for that. Not, it's not my style. I explained in an earlier tape, people tell me a full twist punch is traditional. If you can give me as many reasons why you do a full twist punch as why I do that punch or why that punch is a good secret punch. I'd like to hear from you about it. Same here, if you have a good reason, and not that, that there's some guy that's great big and fast and strong can run up and knock him down with that chop. I believe that. If a guy's a good fighter, he's a good fighter. If he has an improper technique, my advice should help him. Somebody watching this tape should get a little advice, maybe learn something, and straighten the thumb out. That allows the energy to keep coming. This stops the energy here. This makes a pressure point weak right here. I explained this pressure point on my last tape. But it makes 
makes it weak when you bend the thumb, where in fact it won't be weak if the thumb is straight because of energy release. Anybody, you can test this on somebody without any damage. If the thumb is bent, you only have to push it. In a fight situation, if we were in close and he made this kind of a hand, I would chop him right there. I would chop that thumb. I wouldn't even go for that. I would chop right there because this is what will happen. You can take anybody and push the thumb this way, like a gun. Like you shoot a gun, just do this and put your person down. When it's straight, the reason he goes down is he backs up his energy and stops it from releasing here and he makes this pressure point weak that lies right midway on this bone, there. Energy comes down, it crosses over, and it goes back. As it's crossing over, the energy is flowing towards the ridge hand. When you do that, you stop it there at the ridge hand and make that weak. This, being straight, allows the energy to rush out. And then you can use that into your opponent. So if he cocks that thumb, I can just chop him there. So if I were to correct anything that would be most basic, it would be for this thumb to be straight. This little finger in here, you now have a rich hand you can use. You have a chop hand you can use. You have a knife hand, a thrust hand, knife that you can use. You have a palm that you can use, and you have even the whole smack with a cupped hand that you can use to hurt someone. We're going to break it in. I want to explain that so when we look at katas that do this, that is the most important part. That that move is correct. To me, this is incorrect because you can feel it's weak. You try this, get used to this a few days, and you, you can't go back to that bent thumb. I did a bent thumb for 20, 25 years till I was told, no, this is straight. When you do a kata, all the moves hidden in the kata are to pressure points, and they show angle and direction. I'm going to bring Sandra Schlesman up, and she's a student of mine at the Dillman Party Institute in Reading, and she is going to do the peon katas from Okinawa, the way our style does them. It, it, every style is different. The way you do a kata means nothing. It's whether you know the interpretation. Everybody argues over who has the right moves. Is this right or is this right? The person's right that knows, if he knows the angle and direction and where he's hitting with that hand. That's the person that's right. Some styles call these the heon, some call them the peon, some call them just advanced forms. What I really am getting at, we're gonna do the forms a little slow, not, not uh, faster, but slow. So you can see the moves, because I'm going to break down those moves, because the original pinyon forms came from the original Tai Chi pattern that got passed down, and the moves of the hands are in most other katas that you would do. And if your style does not do a kata, that doesn't matter also, because then you can get my self-defense patterns and pick them up and practice them as self-defense routines. Thank you. Sandra Slush.
it doesn't matter whether you do the kata like that. What I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that pressure points, angle, and direction are what are needed to understand that type of a kata or move. When she kicks, now I understand some of you use a snap kick and some of you use a thrust kick. The difference in it is, a snap kick and a thrust kick. A snap kick is generally used to the insides of the thighs. Can be used to the groin, but the inside of the thigh. Because the nerve on the inside of the thigh is relatively closer to the skin surface, a snap kick will work and injure your opponent. The side of the thigh has a lot of muscle. The nerve's a little deeper, and thrust kicks are usually used to attack it. And by thrust, we mean lock out and use the bottom of the foot, not the knife edge. If you turn the knife edge of your foot, you stretch the nerve in your own leg and make your own leg weak for attack, which will be covered in our legs pressure point portion of a different tape. But when you stretch and turn a knife edge, you actually create a weakness in this area that if attacked, you are more vulnerable. So it stands to reason you don't want to be more vulnerable. So when we teach you to kick, we teach you to kick with the bottom or the flat part of the foot, the part that you walk on. And in tournament competition, that particular kick would look sloppy. But in a street situation, a real fighting situation, separating the real fighting from the sport, you would use the bottom of the foot and you would attack the knees or the thigh and the leg must lock out. Bob Hauk, come out here. It's Bob Hauk, and he's one of the uh, students here. A person this large, if I snap kicked him in the outside of that leg, he's gonna keep coming at me. It wouldn't work. So if I kick or attack, I must thrust to do damage to my man. I must thrust, or I wouldn't stop a person this large. On the inside of the thigh, on the inside of the thigh I kick, but I must snap in and back to just get into the nerve. I do not have to kick anybody in the groin. As I mentioned in earlier tapes, Eyes move, go to the eyes and people will flinch. There isn't anyone in the world that doesn't flinch a groin kick. But as he flinches the groin kick, he stretches the nerve on the inside of the thigh, which is also on the liver meridian. He stretches the nerve and makes it vulnerable and creates points in here that can do as much damage as kicking the groin by kicking them on the inside, you all right? by kicking him on the inside of the thigh. He didn't know he was getting that. He just showed up for our videotaping, and we get him up and kick him inside the thigh. But I wanted just to see how that works when a person is large, because we attack on the inside of the thigh with the kick. You don't have to be able to kick the groin. If you know how to kick properly, you know angle, direction, pressure points, you truly can be a 70 or an 80 year old person, and you only have to have a kick this high. In real self-defense situations, I tell everyone, never kick the face. If I try to kick him up in the face in the chest, he grabs my foot, he dump it. All my weight's on the other leg. If he kicks that leg, he'll break it. If I'm kicking up high, my groin's open for an attack. All your kicks to your opponent should be with your legs below his waist. There's enough of pressure points down here to attack that I don't have to raise up high. My hands are for up high, that's for down there. Okay, thank you. The moves in the kata were created by samurai, and samurai, in my opinion, now the person that created this kata knows why he created the moves. If I created the kata, only I would know, and a lot of the true secrets were taken to the grave with the person. Some of them were passed on. But taking the study of the martial arts and the katas as deep as I have, and getting into the angle and the direction, if what I tell you does not make sense, then you have to get involved in more study. You've got to understand your content, how it applies on your opponent. 
We're going to break down those pinions. We will not break down every move because of the length of the tape, but we will give you an idea, and I hope my idea helps or expands your particular style. Sandy and Larry. Okay, Sandy is just going to show what my, what my idea in theory, and it's not my idea. Other people have the same idea. There's people that teach pressure points. I've, since I got into the study, I found out there's people teaching pressure points all over the United States. Not all over as a, as a mass. They're not a, that easy to find. But there are people that are doing pressure point study in the South, in the Midwest, out West, out in Japan, in Okinawa. And they're all working the same theory. I have been behind closed doors with these people, and we sat and talked about things that wouldn't openly be discussed otherwise. Now that I am involved in my pressure point study, I have had some Chinese people and some Okinawan people talk to me as they wouldn't talk to me before this. As you enter into pressure point study, if you came to me, for instance, and you know these six pressure points, and you came to me for a lesson, I gotta show you another pressure point. That's why you came for a lesson. So I gotta teach you something. And then when you get that next pressure point and you go to another person, he's happy to add one or two more if he knows you're in that study. The only thing you have to be humble with, you have to be humble and not pushy and not make like you know. Ask questions. That's how I found out a lot of this information. Too many people in this country do a move and they just go, yes, sensei, thank you. They don't go, sensei, what is that move really for? Sensei, in addition to a block, what could it be? I have videotapes of some high Okinawan instructors teaching seminars. And I see the Okinawan instructor doing a pressure point on a video. There's a pressure point, there's a, a tape that is out for jujitsu. And the man who is doing the tape, I, I don't want to give any names, but the man recording it is an American. And the man showing the move is a very little oriental person. And the little oriental person on that tape is kicking his opponent inside the thigh where I just kicked the big man. He's kicking him inside the thigh on a pressure point, dropping him. The American is explaining on the tape, Sensei is now kicking his opponent in the groin. I'm watching his tape. The American must have thought Sensei was too old to get his foot that high. That's, that was wrong. Sensei was kicking him right where Sensei wanted to kick him. He was kicking him on a pressure point. That's the thing you have to look for. I have many tapes now. I have a collection to blow most the average person's minds. I have people breaking down Tai Chi moves and forms inside communist China on video. I have many of the masters in Okinawa breaking down stuff. And these tapes were gotten for me by service people. And I have a collection. I keep adding to it. Hundreds of hours now of people doing what I'm explaining, <clears throat> and yet I try to introduce this to other Americans and they want to they want to say, no, no. My instructor taught me everything there was to know about these katas. You watch what they're doing. I have a tape of an Oriental man right now in this country teaching seminar. I got the videotape, I just looked at it, and he's showing a lot of what I'm doing. He's doing what I'm showing. And they're doing the blocking and that portion. You've got to look deeper and understand why all these years you've read that the answers are contained in the kata. A kata was a samurai saying, we're going to fight. We're here. A fight started like this. 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 A fight started with hands on. The same way a thousand years ago a fight starts now. We were arguing. That was your wife? I didn't know. Bang! That's the way a fight started. I didn't know she was your wife. But you stand here, and we were arguing, and one would 
go for the other, and the moves in the katas were the counters in case he would. In case he would move at you. This move, I explained on earlier tapes, if he waves the fist, this will put him down. We're going to break apart some of the pinyon so you understand, but then I want you to find your own moves and your own kata to enhance your style. I hope in a way this helps you. She is going to do the move between Larry and I, and I will explain it down as if we were facing. Take one step back, start pinyon one. And by the way, some people call pinyon one this one, some call it this one, some call it this pinyon one, some call it pinyon two. It doesn't matter as long as you call it. It could be just kind of anything if you understand the moves. I hear people that argue over whether this is pinyon one or pinyon two. What does it matter if you don't understand the moves? I go to them and say, what's this for? You know what they tell me? Block it. Do that first move. They tell me this is blocking a punch. He's punching at me, and I'm blocking. And I say, what's this hand for? And they say, ready. I say, ready for what? You're all exposed. You're open. Your weak points. That move is in case you're standing here, and your opponent attacks you hand or foot. It doesn't matter. Hand or foot, he attacks, and that move is this. That makes greater sense. At long range, if it's a big person, that move can be to the crazy bone area also. Remember the weapons and the arms, we use this. The Oriental Master that I told you that had 10 weapons and the most basic is punching. We use this, we use this bone, this bone, this bone, this bone. We even sneak that knuckle in. People say, well, you can't punch with that knuckle and hurt anyone. No, but it digs and does this great. Like a drill. Vibrating hand. We do this, and we attack with that knuckle to a pressure point. When you attack a pressure point, one of the reasons you haven't found pressure points is the tip is only that big to hit. One of the reasons you were told to keep punching because you can't punch a pressure point. Let's say the eye's the pressure point. What's going to hurt him most? If I take and punch his eye, uh, it'll hurt. Or if I take one finger and go like that and put it right into the eye, that's going to hurt the most. The eye basically can be a pressure point. What's going to hurt if I punch or I attack with one of these odd-shaped fists that you read about to a pressure point? That's what's going to hurt. That's what's going to hurt the most. So when he attacks at me, I can punch, attack short range. This hand can block, but we don't call this block like block and there's no answer. It stops the move and attack simultaneously the way it is in the kata. Both hands move together. This can stop him, but in pressure point work, we try to grab the opponent's wrist, holding two pressure points while we strike. Does everybody understand? If I grab this wrist pressure point, the two that are a half inch up, and pull the arm, I stretch the muscle through here that makes my opponent weak right up in here. So I stretch as I strike in the ear area, and in that area, no one once struck with that finger, and it's still the same move as in the kata. And that goes the same, and I actually lift this arm to jerk my opponent and make him weak and attack at the same time. Regardless of how strong your man, he cannot resist pump handle, and he cannot resist raise arm up quick. And this move, from a samurai's point of view, can be used. It doesn't matter what punch he throws. He threw a right, suppose he threw a left. There's a hit point on the back of the arm that actually just knocks your opponent down for that smash that's next in the kata. 
that smash that came here can be used with this move or with this move. That smash is to finish off your opponent. And the smash can be used with either move. So he punches at me. It didn't matter. I didn't care with which hand. I attack that arm, trying to hold these pressure points, which make the arm then weaker. I strike. And as he's going down, I would smash. Or, let's say he grabbed me. A samurai started his form the way a fight would start. He grabbed me. What's the next move in the kata? There. Just go to the cross arm. Stop. What could that be? Arms are bent. If he grabs me, his arm will be bent. If I strike him on this pressure point that controls the legs, and this pressure point that controls him keeping a fist, simultaneously, but this pressure point that controls the fist must be struck that direction towards me. But is not the move in the kata coming that direction towards me? And is not that move then heading for that move? Is not this the motion of the kata? So this hand strikes that pressure point towards me, which we all know by now releases the fist, and this one releases bends the knees. But in nine times out of ten, when they're both struck simultaneously, your opponent will turn his head like that, that that smash would kill him, would be the finishing move. So that's why this and that go together. A samurai was standing there and said just those first two moves to kata. This, if he waves the fist at me, I'll put him down. If he punches, he gets this. If he grabs me, he gets this. The smash can go with this or go with this in that particular move. I tell you not to do these moves as hard and rapidly as I even did there. I only did that to make sure he would bend those knees and go for the video. You only have to tap them. When I do a technique, if I just do this and see the knees bend, just see the knees bend, I know my technique will work if I hit harder. I know it will work if I hit on it. And especially if I let this knuckle hit him. What looks like a person's chopping. <clears throat> Remember I told you a proper chop hand. That little finger pulled in, that's that little knuckle. Even on a chop hand, do its job, like I said, the finger to the eye, and get right to the pressure point for you. The narrower point you have hitting a point with energy transfer hurts your opponent more. So that's why that sneaks in. Okay, do the next move in the kata. Okay, stop. The hands just come into the hips. The hand to the hip, and she turns and kicks with a locked leg kick. Now some styles there use a snap kick. Fine, snap kick though, you have to know it's only in here. A lock kicks outside the thighs. The samurai at that point said, what if I am grabbed and I don't want to do this move and he grabs me? I take the two pressure points at the wrist, one half inch up from the joint, north. I take and pull him to here. Doesn't that look the same as this move? A lot of styles call this a catch. I did for years and catch. What are you doing? Nothing. In fact, I even read in one book 
where a man, maybe he didn't know this, I don't know, but he says, you're hiding your weapons from your opponent. You really think a samurai was that stupid? He's a killer. He had a, a, a city of people behind him ready to kill and die for him. You mean I'm fighting this man? And I say, I'm hiding my weapons back here because I'm so deadly. I want to give you a fair break. That doesn't make sense. That means when the hands move to here, that's a self-defense routine. A lot of schools practice this standing still, but when it comes to the kata, they don't associate. I see a lot of schools, grab me, that do this, and do this. But they don't associate, it could be that move. The hands are the same way. Not this way. It does an angle and direction on the pressure points. This way. Now he grabs me, and it could have been on the key. It could have been on the arm. I go to the two pressure points that you know at the wrist. I hold them, and I always torque a pressure point. You understand? I never just grab a pressure point. Anything that I try to do or teach you, I try to make 100%. Grabbing may be only 80% of the time I'm on the pressure point. Torque it. Twist it, as I told you earlier, like a bottle cap. And you'll be on the pressure point 100% of the time. And you dig in. So he grabs me, I grab torque, I come to here, and the kick means I am on metal. Law of nature. I want to kick that leg. Now I told you not to crisscross and kick. So do not experiment with this. But when I work a pressure point on this arm, the opposite leg is weak and will bend first and most. And I can actually break that leg and not this one. When I am on a pressure point on this arm, that leg is vulnerable to attack and not this one. So when I go to here, distance is what turning sideways in that cut. That's why she went sideways. It gives me the distance turning sideways to get to that leg all the way over there with a kick that would injure my man, could break the leg, and because I know the laws of nature, and I'm on two pressure points here, I'm kicking a third over there, my opponent can pass out. One pressure point of the body causes pain, two cause pain in the middle, three pressure points simultaneously cause a person's eyes to go or pass out. Now it takes practice and it takes knowing where they're at and that they work together to make somebody pass out. But just a little experiment, make a fist. If I'm on just these two pressure points of the wrist and I strike just this, keep the camera just on the eyes, I won't knock him out, but you'll see eyes will blink. Eyes blink. Eyes will blink because I did three pressure points simultaneously. That's the meaning of this move in that kata. And the other katas, when we get up there to the moves, that meaning is to grab and hit this pressure point and strike, which means he'll be coming down with his eyes shut. And then you attack the body pressure points. And then that could seriously kill or disable your opponent. Because four pressure points at the same time can kill someone. Five pressure points can kill them, four can kill them, and you might be able to revive him if you know pressure point revival. But if you don't know pressure point revival, five, you don't bring him back. And that's why you'll see moves like this in Tai Chi Kata, and they are using fingertips because there are places in the body that the perfect flowering of the hands can attack five pressure points. Okay, do, do another move to the car. Pinyon one. Okay, we explained that. We explained those. And we explained those as being arm breaks. Go into uh, the second pinyon. So we're going to try to touch on all four pinions.
Okay, let's stop at that move. Let's stop at that move. Just do that move slow. Just do that move slow. She goes to a horse stance and strikes down. Turns and strikes. How could that be? How could that be killing someone? We kill Larry. The top of your head that was soft when you were a baby is a vulnerable striking area, and especially if other pressure points were weakened first. Going sideways means to, if even let's say he grabbed that arm or he didn't grab that arm, it doesn't matter, or he could grab his arm. The move in the kata goes like this. That means I go sideways beside this arm and strike the pressure point that you see me knock him down. I would go sideways, get him to my body, and strike with this move, which makes my opponent go down. I just go down because I don't want to hit it again, but she won't hit it again. Will we hit that again? Okay. And the next move in the cut of circles to strike the top of the head. Which this spot is very weak. Alright? Very weak spot. That's if he grabs you. Pin, strike, strike is the meaning of that move. If you grab him, you can grab and stretch the arm, stretch and strike, which again knocks your opponent down, and strike. And if it was this arm, I grab him, and I strike the pressure point, and I strike. So when you do this move, that's what you, that's the meaning behind that. This is knock his arm, he drops down, circle, and attack him with that hammer fist. And in some contests, there's a step punch, and then that is certainly to make sure 100% that the man is gone. Next move in that kata. We explained early on that they are arm breaks. We explained early on that they are arm breaks. Three punches. We have three punches. Stop. We have three punches in that kata. One, two, three. Why do we have three punches in most of our basic traditional kata? We punch right, we punch left, we punch right. I used to ask my instructors. Someone told me, so your left hand gets as good as your right. I said, Sensei, I'm only punching once with my left, twice with my right. I'm right handed. Shouldn't I be punching twice with my left, only once with my right to get good with my left? He, no, it's three because it's traditional. The cop out, the cop out, if they don't know, is traditional or don't ask me questions. This is the day and age of computers, videotapes, we're videotaping now. There's too much knowledge that can be shared. Anyone can ask me any question at any seminar. And if I don't know the answer, I try to find out from somebody that does. If I have to go to a doctor, if I have to go to an acupuncturist, acupressurist, I can find out the answer. Don't always have to know every answer to every question. I was taught that in the military. Don't have to know the answer as long as you know where to find it. Books are there. Same with a lawyer. All those books on the shelf and all the law, he doesn't know, but he knows where to find them when the court case comes up. You have to find the answer. That means some people have to go back to school, do a little study, a little work. But three punches, right, left, right, tell you, me, where the weak places are on my opponent. There are twice as many heart pressure points on this side of my body, now the heart is not on that side, it's here and leans that side. But if you've seen anyone who had a stress test, you will see that they hook twice as many suction cups and wires on this side of the body than they do here. They'll put anywhere from six to nine over here. Could even do 12. They only do three over here. Right, left, right tells you, the samurai, that my man is twice as vulnerable on this side of his body than that side because it's heart control. That's why we punch right, we 
We punch left. We punch right because I can hit a heart, only hit a heart or a liver, and hit a heart pressure point. And I have twice as many over here. And if you want to find out exactly what heart pressure points are, I know, but I, you can't give those in a video because somebody's not going to hurt somebody. Go get a stress test, and they'll put the suction cup there, and you go home, you'll have the, you'll have the marks. And you'll have twice as many here as you have there. So that's why going back in that kata was three punches. And that's why even a basic kata like Tayoka 1, age pattern. Everybody does age pattern. That's why there's right, left, right.